Hello and welcome back. Uh, so in this video, we're going to take a quick look at the Freedom OLED hardware. Um, now, it's used in the Monkey Listen project, but the idea here is that you could take this and uh, do some cool stuff uh, with the Freedom OLED. So I'm on the community page for the Freedom OLED. Um, so if you got to this video, uh, you obviously made it. You know how to get here. So um, what I want to do is just talk a little about what the Freedom OLED is. Um, we're going to review the schematic and look at the design package. So uh, the main features, um, it has a New Haven 2.7-inch uh, uh, graphic OLED display. Um, the display is 128 by 64 pixels. Um, uh, uh, so it's really cool. Um, the, it looks beautiful when you look, see it in, in real life. Now it can produce each pixel can be shaded to 16 levels. So you can get some nice gradations in there. Um, and it's a nice, just a overall nice looking display. Uh, it's $35, uh, in single quantity. So it's fairly inexpensive. Um, and it's easy to solder. It's a, it's a through hole, through hole mount. Now the freedom OLED board, um, or shield, uh, also includes uh, an electric microphone interface with gain control. We can kind of see this on the left. Uh, that's using the Monkey Listen project for making this audio scope. Uh, just for fun, I added a circuit if you want to hook it up on an RS-45 network. Um, if you don't know what RS-45 is, uh, it's really neat. Um, it's used for making multi-drop networks uh, over fairly long distances. So there's circuitry, so you can enable that. And I also brought out some general purpose I.O. Now, it's a little bit obscured in the picture here because I have two jumpers on it that are used in the Monkey Listen project. But there's two I.O. here kind of brought out to separate pads that can be used as I.O., but they're also brought to A.V. pins. So you could actually turn this into like your own virtual oscilloscope if you wanted to. You could program it. Now, the Monkey Listen project does everything through the microphone for a cool audio scope, but the components are here. Um, to turn it to something else. So let's scroll down here. Um, some notes is that you can order PCBs through Oshpark. Uh, if you've played with any other projects, you'll know that I provide a nice design package. Uh, the, the files are ready to go to order from Oshpark, um, and they're located right here, uh, the complete design package. Now, if you don't know what Oshpark is, Oshpark, uh, you can read about the history on the page, but it's just a low cost uh, site that you can go that to order circuit boards. So it's it's very popular in the open hardware movement. So everyone can kind of upload their stuff. They panelize boards together and uh, you get them back. And they use professional USA uh, uh, board houses made in the USA that they produce very nice results. These are not uh, cheap boards. These are very high quality boards. I, you know, I personally made uh, very expensive boards through all kinds of board houses, and these uh, are on par with you know any U.S. board house. Um, they're they're fairly inexpensive at five dollars a square inch, and you get three copies um, of your board. You know that's on par with anything in the U.S. And if you have small boards, it's very reasonable. Um, so a shield board may be like 30, 30 some odd dollars, $35 and you get three of them, which is a reasonable price. Osh Park just has a really nice way when you upload it, you see a nice preview of your board. Um, it takes about five days to get them fabbed once they're on the panel and then whatever time they're for shipping. So it's a fairly, uh, fairly reasonable, um, uh, you know, turnaround time. They mentioned 12 calendar days. You know, I found out I can generally get quicker than that. It all depends on how many people send in boards and how often they send out the panels, which it turns out is almost every day or sometimes twice a day now. So so you can you certainly use another board house or fabricate them in some, by some other means, but I kind of provide uh, a package for Oshpart. I give you the schematics in a PDF form uh, so you can look at them. But the other thing I, I do is I give you the complete design package. Gerber's schematics, drill files, build materials, and even my raw design files. I use Altium Designer. Um, you may have a copy or may have a copy at school of Altium Designer to use, but it's all here. Everything's kind of out in the open. So what I want to do is quickly download this design package, um, and then we're going to take a look at it. So I've kind of unzipped the desktop. Um, 
I'm going to open up what's in the, the complete design package. At the root level, we see I have my Altium project file. So if you don't have Altium, that's not a big deal. I still give you everything you need to build it. So uh, let's look in the build package folder. So I try to arrange it uh, in a somewhat sane way. So schematics just have that, a PDF version of your schematics. Um, the PCB folder, this has the Gerber data. And you'll see the Oshpark files are in there. The Oshpark, uh, the reason I made a special zip file for it is uh, the file extensions have to be special for Oshpark, um, in particular the GKO for the outline and the XLN for the drill file. But So I gave those for you, but the raw Gerbers that came out of Altium uh, you know, are in here. And then the CCA, stands for Circuit Card Assembly, has everything else. So I have a pick place file, uh, a bill of materials, so we can open that up in Excel format. So enable editing. Um, all right, so here is a bill of materials where I tell you uh, basically uh, all the manufacturer part numbers um, and kind of where to get them. So you've got a nice uh, bomb to work from. So I'll close that out. Do you have a nice parts list? Nope. The assembly prints are, it's a simply a PDF file. I generate that to help me with hand soldering. So I can look at the top and bottom layer, see the silk screen and the parts, uh, so I know where to put things. So we have a layer print for the top layer and then the bottom layer. So you know I can see where the parts are and the designators. So that's all, excuse me, the assembly drawing is. Um, and yeah, lastly in here is the pick place file. Now that's that's only useful is if uh, you're running it through a pick place process, but um, it just has coordinates of the part. So so the fact that you have a schematics bomb Gerber hat, you have everything you need to recreate the design and, and kind of hack into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the schematic. Now I'm not going to look at the PDF. I want to open up in Altium Designer format because it's a little bit easier for me to pan around. So and I just want to step through the schematic, and I'm going to show you the kind of pieces and parts here. So first, um, at the top of the schematic, I have the header interface. So what I did here, and I want to take a minute to explain, uh, you know, the header and the pinout, because it looks complex, but it's it's uh, less complex than, than than you may think. So because there are so many freedom boards uh, out there this this was the monkey listen project was for the k20 d50 but there's many others so um, what I did is I kind of made a template of all the common ones that I use and just named all the signals that are available so j10 here is j10 on the k20 d50 but it's j4 on the kl46 I just kind of listed out the net names and then what I did is I showed the net names going to the pins of the chip for these different variants. So, for example, pin 11, um, I called it K20. This goes to ADC 0 minus 0. Um, now, for what I did is I also included uh, kind of like a generic name because as I'm building up my library here of boards, I just kind of gave this IO19 and that's what I used throughout the schematic. So anywhere you see IO19, that's the same as K20 D50 ADC0. It's the same as the KL250 port E30. Um, and so that's just how things map into the dev boards. Now all the example software is for the K20 D50 but there's enough here you could remap it. And if you have a board that's not listed here, it's fairly easy to back everything out. But everything in the other parts use the generic name. Use the generic name to map back to uh, your particular board. For example, the K20D50. So let's first look at the Electrap microphone. So I include in the YouTube playlist um, a video from the EEV blog. Uh, that explains how electrap microphones work. I'm not going to go through the, the entire theory here, um, but there's plenty on the web of how electrap microphones work. So all electrap microphones uh, require some bias through a bias resistor. So in this case, this microphone requires about a 2.2K resistor that you hook to the plus side and you pull it up to 3.3 volts. And so 
think of this electret. Uh, it, it's kind of got a, a dynamic impedance that changes with sound pressure. So as you get a sound wave hitting the electret microphone, this impedance goes up and down and it pulls down the voltage here up and down. You get uh, essentially a divider. So nominally, this, this point sits pretty high, almost near 3.3 volts, but as it gets acoustic pressure, it drops low, and you get a little wiggle of a voltage here as you get an acoustic pressure on the microphone. So that's a very quick look at how this works. So um, look in the playlist for to, to, um, to get more theory on the electret, but that's as much as you need to know, that you get a voltage here. It's nominally near 3.3 volts, but as you get an acoustic pressure um, impinging on the microphone, it gets pulled down and is proportional to that AC, this, um, this dynamic pressure, this changing pressure. So the first thing I do is buffer it because I can use a single supply op amp circuit because my signal here normally sits near 3.3 volts and then moves low and it's very small. Um, so I can use a single supply buffer. Then what I run it into is a circuit that is a single supply gain stage. Um, so the single supply gain stage, we have to give it a midpoint voltage. In this case, I create a midpoint voltage through a voltage divider, and I, I filter it. I put a little uh, 0.1 microfarad filter to give me a nice stable voltage that's at half the microphone supply, and that's my midpoint voltage. And then the other section is just an inverting amp, where I have a 2.2K resistor and a 50K potentiometer. So the output signal of this uh, electric microphone is very small, tens of millivolts. So I want to gain it up for my A to D converter, and uh, I need a midpoint of about 1.5 to 1.6 volts. And I want to swing around that. So this circuit is just a very common uh, single supply um, excuse me, single supply inverting amplifier. So I want to quickly uh, redirect you here to um, a nice application note called a single supply circuit collection. Uh, was once published by National Instruments, which is now Texas Instruments. Um, SLOD006A uh, is a reference. This is a great reference for doing anything, any kind of op amp on a single supply. So they they kind of take you through. Uh, all a bunch of different variants of um, you know single supply configurations. Now here's an example of one um, inverting op amp with non-inverting positive reference. So right here's that's essentially what I did is I put a reference voltage right here. I feed in my signal, um, you know, and then you gain it up. Simple as that. So I'll let you take a look. It's a great it's a great reference if you ever want to know how do you do things on a single supply. So this circuit essentially came right from that manual where I take my signal. Now notice I AC couple it into this stage because nominally at essentially zero acoustic pressure, there's no uh, waveform, um, no uh, AC pressure coming in. This will sit at almost 3.3 volts. Well, this, this circuit here has to sit around the midpoint. Well, uh, that's why I AC couple it. So what will happen here is because I AC coupled it, if there is zero volt AC, remember AC coming in here, this will nominally sit at my midpoint that I feed in right here. And by using the cap, any little perturbations that happen here get applied upon the midpoint and then get, only get amplified. So only the perturbations around the midpoint get amplified. So at the end of the day on IO8, I get my AC waveform from my microphone and they sit at one half of the power supply from my microphone, at one half 3.3 volt. So what's IO8? Well, if I back this out, IO8, generic is here. That's port C0 um, on my K20D50. And I can back that out. That is an A to D pin on the K20 D50. Um, you can look in the example software to see what that is. So on the Arduino R3, that's analog input A0. Now my microphone power, you'll notice my supply rail says 3.3 volt mic. So I actually, what I do is the main power 5 volts coming in 
which either can come from an external circuit or from my board, I actually give the microphone its own clean supply rail. The reason I do that is electrets are very sensitive to whatever you apply with this bias voltage. If there's any noise on this signal right here, it essentially gets dumped to the output of that op amp. It's going to happen. So you need a neat, a nice, clean, uh, you know, bias voltage for that mic. So that's why it has its own regulator. Um, and the second part I want to point out is this is the interface to the New Haven display. Notice I just tie all these signals to a bunch of I.O. Um, and give it power. So the OLED, its VDD, gets its own regulated supply. Notice I have this big fat 220 microfarad capacitor. Um, it's a separate supply path from the microphone. And that, that's very important because if you didn't do that, you would actually see uh, noise on your microphone circuit. There's some switching noise that happens on the microphone. Excuse me, not the mic, the, uh, the OLED. So the, any noise that is on this supply to the OLED, if I didn't have a separate path, it would show up on the mic um, and it, it is undesirable. So, so that's why I have a separate power supply path. So the interface to the New Haven display, it's simple. I just run a bunch of I.O. and I bit bang the I.O. from the software to get my uh, graphic display. And the, the example driver, you know, you know, the example code for the monkey listen will, will give you that. So the last part here, I kind of threw in for fun. Because for some of the other projects I had in mind, I threw in on the TX and RX signal um, an RS-485 transceiver. So RS-485 is um, can, can be used for setting up multi-drop networks among many devices. And these RS-485 drivers are very noise immune because it is differential. You're driving differential down the line. Um, you can go quite long distances. So if you want to have three or four boards on a network, you can set up an RS-45 network. Now, RS-45 is fairly low level. The, um, whatever you transmit goes out on the bus and everyone receives. So it's very important in when you write your software, you have to come up with a protocol to make sure more than one person isn't transmitting at one time. But once you figure that out, it's like reading and writing a serial port. You just write data, um, it goes out on the bus, um, and other people can read it. You just have to come up with your own protocol is, is, is how you do that. Um, all right. So, and I have a little termination resistor. So you can use that or not. You don't have to. Um, and then the other thing I do is I just have some uh, solder pads here um, for two IO signal. You could tap into it by another means. I did that so I could put some jumpers on for the monkey listen for some different modes. They go to IO 10 and 11. IO 10 and 11 go to some generic IO that are also A to D converter inter, uh, uh, inputs. So what's kind of cool with this board is you could kind of, if you wanted to, if you build a little uh, circuit, you could kind of turn this into your own like virtual oscilloscope or virtual voltmeter. Um, or maybe you want to make it a display for some other sensor that you want a real-time display for a sensor. Um, all right, so so that's it. Um, that's all there is to it for the schematic. Now, one thing I want to point out because I got asked this question: the revision numbers in hardware for all everything I do, um, everything Eli does, I use Greek letters. So when you see Rev Beta, that doesn't mean this is like beta software; it's untested or not tested very well. That's just essentially think of it as Rev B. This is the second Rev of the board. The first one was a pre, you know, a pre-production test. Um, I just always use Greek letters for hardware. Um, that's just a, 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 a common, you know, a common convention. So let's look really quick at the PCB. I like out the reason I love Audi Designer is I can hit the three key here and let let's let this it's just got to build up this and I get a three D view. So we can see over here. Here's my potentiometer, my microphone. Um, let me rotate this around here. Here's my input for my spare A to D converters, you know, my RS-45, and then uh, that's about it. Like, let's flip it over. We can see that there's not that many parts on it. Here we got the monkey. Um, so we have our Electrap microphone interface over on this side, a uh, handful of components, the optional RS-45, and our voltage regulator. So 
Uh, really, you could put this together, this board together in about half an hour. Um, it, it, it's pretty quick. And if you've never done surface mount soldering, there's plenty of tutorials on the web to learn how to do surface mount soldering. Don't be afraid of it. Um, these are 1206 sized uh, chip resistors and cap capacitors. That's a great size to start with. So, so there is the Freedom OLED. Um, in a quick review, uh, I hope you build it and make something cool with it. If you do, make sure you share it with the community. Uh, we love to see what uh, other people are doing. So catch you later.